in our last couple of studies that we've done, we had taken a look at the character of Jesus. The Lord Jesus Himself and uh, and His teachings that we said was that we call the greatest in the kingdom of God. Jesus taught much on the greatest in the kingdom of God and He taught it mainly and mostly by example. The life that He lived. You see, the overall takeaway is that Jesus Christ is the ultimate Savior. He's the ultimate God. And He showed that by coming and living among mankind and serving. Serving others. And He called us to do the very same thing. To be imagers of Him. In the 14 characteristics that we looked at in the last two studies on servant life, we learned just how much Jesus was driven by love. And that love for others should be a driving factor in our lives as well. It should be how we should act towards others. We should show love. Now as we get into this next series, again this is a three part series that we will be digging into. And we're going to take a look at the Father. You see the past two studies we looked at the Son. We looked at His actions there in the New Testament, we might say. But this one, we're going to go back into the Old Testament and look at the characteristics of the Father. Now, you see, I've heard it said before, speaking of God of the Old Testament, well, He's mean. He's harsh. He seems to be an angry God, always just punishing people, it would seem, to some that just kind of uh, carelessly reads through the Old Testament. It could seem that way. And then they'll look and say, but Jesus, the God of the New Testament, is one of love and He's graceful and merciful. And so in this series that we're going to begin tonight, a three-part series, we're going to look at the character of God from the Old Testament. And we'll see that, hey, this too, the God of the Old Testament is just as much a God of love Grace and mercy is the God of the New Testament. For that matter, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are one and the same. They're in such unity that Jesus even said this. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So they're one. They're one. And so that we can know that the God of the Old Testament is love. And guess what? The God of the New Testament, Jesus, if we want to you know, kind of separate them in that way, the Father and the Son... Well, he also had a harsh side. He wasn't just all soft-spoken and, and, and always calm. He wasn't a pushover. You see, do you remember the time that he went into the temple and he made the whip and he drove out the money changers and he knocked over their the tables, right? God of the New Testament had a side to him that demonstrated that, hey, there was a time for wrath as well. Again, these two tie together. They're one God. Now, the most known verse in the New Testament, and if I just ask you what that is, most of you could quote what it is. The most known verse, you'd probably say John 3.16, right? It's the one we know. And if you didn't know that, when I said John 3.16, you said, oh yeah, that's it. And you know what it is. It's for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Even this verse, this well-known verse, the one that just about the whole world probably knows to some degree, it begins with, for God so loved. It speaks of God's love. But I just really bring this verse up to say that this verse, as well-known as it is from the New Testament, there's a verse that's similar, speaking of God, in the Old Testament. Similar in the fact that it is a well-known verse. Probably the most used verse in the Old Testament, is from Exodus chapter 34. So you can begin turning there. See, Exodus chapter 4, these two verses, verse 6 and 7, is where we will spend the next three lessons digging into, exploring the character of God. So Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7. As you turn there, though, I want to take a moment to give credit to the Bible Project You see, much of this information in these next three studies, this series that we're calling Character of God, I've dug out from their studies on the character of God. No, it's it's much information that can be found at 
at BibleProject.com. So if you're interested, if this study here that we're going to do strikes your attention, you say, hey, I want to know more about the character of God, BibleProject.com. So by now you should be in Exodus 34. And so we're going to just start by reading verse 6 and 7, and then we're going to jump back and look at what this is in the center of, what's taking place to get us to these words that Jesus, that, that, not Jesus, that God spoke of Himself. So verse 6 says, And the Lord passed by before Him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for a thousands, forgiving iniquity, and transgressions and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, Visit, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. So in this three-part series, if you notice, I left verse 6, or part of verse 6 there on the screen, because we are going to dig into five points or five characteristics found in what God said about Himself. You see, He said, The Lord, the Lord, or Yahweh, Yahweh, Elohim, merciful. He says He's merciful. This word can be uh, also uh, compassionate. And that's the one that we'll go more with throughout our study. But it's merciful or compassionate. And the Hebrew is raccoon. The next is gracious. The word gracious in Hebrew is kanun. And we're going to just dig into these words throughout our study. The third is long suffering. This in Hebrew is eric apayim. And it can mean long suffering, but what we're going to see as we dig into this characteristic of the Lord is that it simply means that he's slow to anger. And then the fourth is goodness. The Hebrew word for goodness is kesed. And it speaks of God's loving kindness, His steadfast love. And the Bible project will use the word loyal love as we go through the study. And then the fifth characteristic of the Lord that we're going to see is truth. The Hebrew being a met, and it deals with faithfulness or truthfulness that God can be trusted, that He's true. Now, the reason I mention the Hebrew word to you, because we're going to dig deeper into this study as we get into our second and third part. For this one, we will not. But we're going to dig into what is behind the meaning of these words in order that we can really learn the character of the Father, the Father God. But within tonight's study, we're going to bring these two verses into context. Again, y'all know I don't like to just pull verses out and just run with it. I'd like you to know why God is saying what He's saying about Himself here in this particular case or other verses. I want to know you want you to know why they are where they are, what is being said within the context of Scripture. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to dig in to uh, what's taking place. What's taking place to get us to this point? Now, if you're Think in your minds and you can start moving your Bible back to Exodus 19 because we're going to slowly move forward to get back to Exodus 34, 6 and 7. But what has taken place is the nation of Israel had been freed from captivity. They were captive by the Egyptians. They had been in captivity for many years. And God sent a deliverer. He sent Moses in to say, let my people go. But it wasn't an easy departure there was much trouble, right? At least for the Egyptians, uh, because the ten plagues was sent, or these different signs, they were strikes against the Egyptians' gods. And the Egyptians on hit number ten, they decided, hey, we better let these people go. So they told the Israelites, go, leave, leave as quick as you can. And that's what the Israelites did. They went out, they get to the Red Sea, and then the Egyptians changed their mind. If you remember, they're coming at the Israelites. So the Israelites are trapped and then God does something else miraculous. He parts the Red Sea in order for these this nation to be able to go through on dry ground. And then as they pass through, behind them, left in the waters are the Egyptians. Because when they come through, the waters close back up. 
So that's taken place. And then a few other things with the children of Israel as they're traveling out into the wilderness. But now they come to Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, they will spend the next year getting to know God. And, and we might say getting to know how, oh, how much of failures they are because they struggle during this time as they will struggle throughout their whole wilderness wandering and throughout their whole, uh, their whole, whole on existence for that matter, they struggle. And so that's where we're at is at Mount Sinai. And from Exodus 19 through 24, Moses mediates a covenant between God and between mankind, between these Israelites, this nation. He, he's the mediator in a sense. God, Yahweh, and Israel are making a covenant. And it's all God's doing. God's going to be the one that says, hey, this is what type of people I want you to be. So in Exodus 19, verses 4 through 8, God speaks to Moses and He says, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto Myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey My voice indeed, and keep My covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto Me, above all people, for all the earth is Mine. And ye shall be unto Me a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. See, God has a special purpose for this nation. They were His chosen people for a special reason, for for a purpose. See, they were to be a kingdom of priests. Not just a kingdom with some priests in it, but they were supposed to be a nation that that was a priestly nation, a holy nation, a set-apart nation that would show the world, those around them, the other nations, hey, this is the God that we should be serving. Yahweh is the one. He's the one above all others. They were to be a light. And in verse 7, And Moses came, and he called for the elders of the people, and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Can you see the covenant here, right? God said, hey, you're going to be my people and uh, I want you to be set apart. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. They agreed. They said, God, we're going to do your command. We're going to do your will. But only a chapter later in Exodus 20, verse 18 through 21, We read, And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. We see the people were called to be a holy priesthood. They were to be all priests. And here they're kind of saying, Well, Moses, we'd rather you pick out, you do it, and, and then eventually some was picked out the, from the Levites, and, and they were the priestly group that was within this nation. They kind of forfeited in a sense here because they was fearful of encountering God. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that His fear may be before your faces that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. Now you see, earlier in this chapter, at the beginning of chapter 20, the Ten Commandments are given. That that kind of list of the covenant of what uh, they were to do. And it certainly wasn't the only commands. There will be about 612 to 13 more laws or commands given throughout Scripture. But these ten were written down in a sense to mark this covenant. And then Moses ascended to the mountain and spoke there to receive or or to receive more laws. And then when we get to chapter 24, so jump a few chapters with me now, we will see Moses again with the people. What you'll notice if you dig into these few chapters here from about chapter 19 through 24 and on to 34, really Moses is up and down this mountain. 
He doesn't need one of them stair-stepping machines in his tent. He's getting a plenty of exercise going up and down this mountain. He'll go and speak to the Lord. He'll come back and say what's been said. And here in Exodus 24, we're going to look at verse 3. And Moses came and he told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, they said again, all the words which the Lord has said will we do. So no doubt the people, they were committed. They felt like they were committing themselves to God's will in their lives. They said that they would do it. So Moses was called back upon the mountain again, and this time he's going to receive the sign of the covenant. God's going to give him something that would be placed before them to show, hey, we agreed upon this, that I will be your God and you will be my people. Right? They said they would do it. So God's going to give him some stones that God actually writes upon. In Exodus 24, verse 12, Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there. And I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. Now from chapters 25 through 31, Moses is on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. He's receiving instructions from God, even instructions on how to worship, how the Israelites were to set up this tabernacle and they were to go and, and to worship Yahweh and how the different furniture and different things were to be set and built. And, and it was just the, it was kind of the structure of worship for the Israelites. And again, the tables of stone, these tablets, the Lord wrote on to give to Moses. And then if you move a little further into Exodus 31, verse 18. Exodus 31, 18, we read, And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. So Moses had the sign of a covenant here. These stone engravings in order to show, hey, we are God's people and we are to obey His commands. So everything's going great up to this point, right? It seems wonderful. This covenant is being established. <laughs> then we turn to chapter 32. And you can go ahead and make your way there in the next chapter, chapter 32. See, this is when we learned that the Israelites, while Moses was on the mountain with God, the Israelites were, was in the valley with a calf, with a golden calf that they had made to begin worship. What we found out is that as they said all the words which the Lord has said we will do, they just, it fell short for them. They didn't seem to stick to it. They, they fell short in this way. They weren't, were not actually doing what God had called them to do. They began worshiping other gods quickly. See, Moses had been on the mountain for 40 days and nights, and the people said, hey, we don't know what has happened to this man, so let us make gods and worship them. Hey, these are the ones that brought us out of Egypt. So they worshiped this golden calf or the gods that was represented by this golden calf. And in verse 9 of Exodus 32, we read, And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. And I want you to just note that stiff-necked, because we're going to see that word again. These are a stiff-necked people, a hard head we might would refer to them as. is just disobedient. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them. And that I may consume them. And I will make of thee a great nation. Again, God's going to work. But he's going to, he says, He is going to make a great nation. Regardless of what these people wanted to do or not. But this is where we see Moses step in as an intercessor. He begins interceding for the people. He intercedes for them once here. And then he goes down the mountain. He's going to come back up the mountain here in a minute. But he goes down and he shatters the stones before them because they broke God's covenant. And that's what that was showing is they broke it. Then he destroyed the calf that they was worshiping and he calls the sons of Levi to come and execute judgment on the people. So there was many that died at this point. But then he heads back up the mountain. And then at verse 30 in the same chapter, Exodus 32, 
we read, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I'll go up unto the Lord. Preadventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. So once Moses is back on this mountain before God, again he's interceding, just more intercession for the people. But this time he offers his own life. He says, God, I will be a sacrifice for them. But hey, that wasn't for Moses to do. That would happen years later, right? Our Lord Jesus, a greater than Moses, would come to be the sacrifice for people, for mankind. So the Lord tells Moses that, hey, the one that sins is the one that's guilty in this case, and that they would be held accountable. But Moses, he continues to intercede for them throughout chapter 33. And then when we come to the interse- uh, to the intercession where God's character is revealed, further down in Exodus 33, verse 18 through 23. These are where we'll begin getting close to the five traits that God is going to speak about Himself. So notice here in verse 18 of chapter 33. And He said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. This is Moses back on the mountain speaking to God. And He said, God said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And He said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts but my face shall not be seen. I think it's interesting if you just look back there at verse 19, notice the goodness and then on down the graciousness and the mercy. Here, the na- and notice also uh, the name of the Lord because that's what it, God is going to proclaim, the name of the Lord. But we see God's goodness, His grace, His mercy and I think that it's interesting that we have that there. It's kind of a prelude. It's kind of a uh, a beginning right before the other stones are cut. You see, God tells about what He's going to show Moses. I'm going to show you my goodness, my mercy. And then in verse 4 of Exodus 34, we read in He, Moses hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai. So he had come back down. He had cut out two more stones and he heads back up after God said, Hey, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you my goodness. And he heads back up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Again, notice that. You know, when the writers of the Hebrew Bible as well as the writers of the New Testament, when they are writing, they're doing things intentional. So notice how in verse 19 they said the name of the Lord. So that's a bookmark. And then here, after the cutting of the new tables and and God coming and, and dealing with it, ministering there, we see that He proclaimed the name of the Lord. See, and that's where we get to verse 6. What's the name of the Lord about? Now, we've spoken of that before. I've mentioned to you many times that the name of the Lord has so much, so much more than just a name. Just a, hey, you know, this is my John Hancock. It has so much more to do. And here we're going to see exactly what it is. Because God is telling what it is. He says again in verse 6, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, the Lord of the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. And again, we're going to look at the depths of them words. The mercy, His compassion, their graciousness, 
long-suffering, that He's slow to anger in His goodness, loyal love in truth or faithfulness in our upcoming lessons. But for now, I want you to move on down to verse 7. He says, Keep in mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Now to some, verse 6 and verse 7 could almost seem like they pull against each other. At least the second part of verse 7. The first part sounds good. Keeping mercy mercy for a thousand, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. Well, that ties certainly into verse 6 of God's graciousness and long-suffering and goodness. But then look, it says that he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon their children. Many have taken this to say, if the father has done it, the children are cursed. And that that is wrong. And we are going to dig into that verse as well once we get to our third part. You see, this doesn't all of a sudden mean, well, I told you, God is angry. Look at it. No, no, that's not at all. We will see that this is actually a gracious act in and of itself, even there in the latter part of verse 7. But again, we will get into that in our uh, in our future lessons, in the next two lessons, as we dig into the character of God. But now, I just want you to know that these attributes of God, verse 7, does not make Him less compassionate or gracious. Now, after receiving this revelation of God's goodness, how good is God? Moses, look at what he does. Verse 8, And Moses made haste, and he bowed his head towards the earth, and he worshipped. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff neck. Remember I said to notice that word? It was already stated that they were a stiff-necked people, wasn't it? And Moses is saying here, God, we know that we are stiff-necked. It's a stiff-necked people. And pardon our iniquity and our sin. And take us for thine inheritance. See, exploring God's character calls Moses to worship. What causes us to worship? That is truly what will cause one to worship is exploring God's character, knowing His goodness. And to kind of mention that, jump into the New Testament just for a moment. Romans 2, 4, Paul says this, speaking of uh, judging others and so, so forth. He says, Or despisest thou the richness of His goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. You see, it's all about God's goodness. And did you notice the words there in Romans 2, 4 that Paul uses? He uses goodness or forbearance, which would be, uh, and it even says, and long-suffering. There are similar words speaking about Jesus that was spoken about the Father in Exodus 34. Getting to know God calls Moses to worship, and getting to know God will cause us to worship. I think, though, that uh, many evangelists have kind of pushed the wrong idea. I think many pre- people at times have went into churches or auditoriums and they have begin speaking of how stiff-necked you are. And so let's say 30 minutes of a 35 minutes of speaking about how bad and going to hell you are. And then the last five minutes is, hey, but there's a Savior. Often that's how evangelists do. It's a stir and it's let you know and you feel like dirt. And I mean, I'm just sorry. And you should, right? I mean, we know that we're, we know that we're stiff-necked. In the last five minutes, it's a stir to, to, to get them to the altar. And it works. It has worked for many of people. It gets them to the altar and then they leave out the door. And we wonder, are they at the altar the next day? Some may. I, I definitely won't say that, you know, I know that many probably are. But we know that there's many that leave the altar that never really have the altar experience in their heart. And I just wonder, what if we kind of shifted that a little bit? Rather than 30 minutes of hell fire in in the last five of grace, what if the 30 minutes, or let's say the first five was, hey, yes, you're you're bad, you're sinning, and, and we're going to hell without Jesus. And then the next 30 is, oh, how good He is. The grace of God and what He has done for us. Again, Paul said the 
that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. It's all about God's goodness. And as Moses experienced God's goodness on Mount Sinai, his response was to worship. And he he prayed that the Lord would go with him. You see, previously the Lord said, hey, I'll send an angel with you, but I'm not going to go with you. But Moses knew that he had to have God's presence with him moving through this wilderness wandering. And he needed God's forgiveness, so he asked that God forgive them. Because again, they were a stiff-necked people. And we know we need God's forgiveness regularly. Because we too find ourselves often stiff-necked. Now what kind of inheritance are these people for God? Again, remember, this is a covenant that God is making. He's making a deal with the people. Hey, I'll be your God and I want you to be my people. I want you to follow me. What kind of deal is God getting? Not a very good one, right? God is getting the bad end of the deal. He's getting a stiff-necked people, people that are just going to, again, fumble and, and falter all throughout their wilderness wandering. And even in the kingdom years, still just struggles. But yet, look what he says in Exodus 34, verse 10. See, even though God is getting the bad end of the deal, and he said, Behold, I will make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible, or another translation is awesome. It is a terrible or awesome thing that I will do with thee. Oh, is it that good to know, right? Because even though we are a stiff-necked people, we have struggles in our lives. And many times maybe we falter and we fall and we feel like just failures. But God has made a covenant with us. And if we have trusted on the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we know we stand firm in that covenant. Again, uh, and now as closing, this here tonight was the introduction to Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7. And we clearly see through this little little two-verse passage that God cares for people. That He's not a mean God in the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament is the one that's gracious. But God is gracious throughout. And He chooses a people for a special purpose. He chooses the nation of Israel for a reason. And I want you to know that God has chosen us for a special purpose too. None of us are just bygones. God wants to use all of us for special purposes. It's important that we find that out. It's important that we will soften our necks up, not be stiff-necked, and that we'll just want to flow into His plan. Because we know that with the children of Israel, as they were stiff-necked and disobedient to God, his perfect will was not able to be worked in their lives many a time. He would have a plan for them, and they would go the wrong way. So many died in the wilderness because they would not go in and take the land that God had for them. For us, we need to know, don't be stiff-necked, but yield ourselves to the Lord. And let Him have His way with us in order that we can walk in His perfect will for our lives because He's certainly faithful. You see, if we falter, it's not because God is doing anything wrong. It's because we're doing wrong. And we need to turn, repent, and get quickly back on His side. Now next week, we'll again start looking at these five characteristics in deeper detail, digging into the Hebrew word. These will be somewhat word studies to really just learn exactly how good God is. So Father, we thank You for Your goodness. We thank You for how much You love us, Lord. And, uh, Father, we ask that you just continue to grow us in your word, not in order that we may just be knowledgeable, but in order that we'll step out of these doors and be influences to the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen.